He has a gripping autobiography known as Falling to Earth. Francis French is a space author, educator, and speaker residing in San Diego, California. After this talk, uh, tomorrow, Francis will speak again as part of Colin Burgess' Outward Odyssey blog on Saturday afternoon. Uh, so, without further ado, welcome our two gentlemen, Al Wharton and Francis French. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Um, I'm wondering, does this roll back, Jay? Because we, we, don't, we, don't, we got a whole bunch of people here who are looking at the back of the stand. I don't, I don't do manual labor anymore. <laughs> we'll just sit here. Well, I can see another three people, so this is good. Hey, there we go. That, that works. works. Hey, over there. <laughs> okay. That works good. Well, it's been my great honor to work with Al on this book, and uh, thinking about what we wanted to do today, I thought of a couple of things, one of which is you want to hear as little as possible from the guy who didn't go to the moon. I know that, and that's what we're going to plan to do. The other thing is, in working with Al on this book, there were a whole bunch of questions and things that came up that really intrigued me, have really intrigued the readers, and as we've been traveling around the country doing a bunch of book signings, we're realizing that there's a bunch of questions that seem to come up all the time, and I know Al has great answers to them. So what I thought we'd try and do today is, trying to keep Al in line is uh, interesting, and there's a, the great thing is there's a different answer every time I ask you a question. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> right, you, you, folks, you folks have to understand a little bit about the relationship between myself and Francis. We got together some years ago. <laughs> we got together some years ago and we started working on a book and uh, we did a lot of it by interview and recording on tape. Uh, we did uh, some of it at the Cape, we did some of it in California, but mostly we did it at my house in Vero Beach. And Francis and I would spend the day talking and taping and this and that and the other thing. But I have to tell you a really little interesting side story. We had a house that had a cabana, and between the cabana and the house was a pool. And one day my wife and I are looking out the window, and here's Francis on the pool deck, laying out flat on the pool deck, looking at a wall, and he had a camera in his hand. So we couldn't figure out what it was. But we saw later that he was out there taking pictures of little lizards. Yeah. That would seem to be his favorite animal. So he was taking pictures of the geckos around our house. So, yeah, but that's kind of the relationship. And Francis, I got to tell you, has got a lot of experience writing. He did several books uh, with uh, Colin Burgess before uh, we did Falling Dirt. Um, <coughs> as a matter of fact, I have to tell you very frankly. Uh, that Francis was a great moderating force on me in doing this book because I would have said some things that were much more unkind than what you read in the book <laughs> if it had been just left up to me. So I appreciate Francis' uh, kind of view of how to do things and let the story speak for itself. Well, thank you, Al. That's incredibly kind of you. It is. It's unusually kind of you. <laughs> the truth is neither kind nor unkind. Well, this is a great project to work on because you, you probably, as space fans out there, know there's always people going, what does Neil Armstrong really think? What was it like? What does Buzz Aldrin really think? They always fixate on the same people. And in Al, you've got somebody who is, Al will sit you down at the bar and say, let me tell you, and tell you exactly what happened, clearly, honestly, with clarity. He's one of the easiest people I've ever had to work with. All I had to do was listen and write down what he said. He's trying and to say that I talk a lot. <laughs> Thank you, because I needed the words. But when people have those questions, what was it like? Here's a guy who will tell you. There are other people who are private. There are other people who are guarded. There are other people who are not as articulate. And it, I'm just surprised it took 40 years to get here, because you, uh, you have the story. So it's a great pleasure. I was waiting you. for you to come along, Francis. <laughs> well, I just wanted somewhere with geckos. We don't have any of them in England. <laughs> Let, let's start with the first question that I think I've probably heard more people ask, ask this question of you than any question, and uh, probably gets a little frustrating after 40 years of asking the same question, but it's, a, it's the standard question, which is people say, you went all the way to the moon, you spent six days in orbit, you spent three days on your own, but you never landed, and all these other guys in the other room, they're the moonwalkers this and the moonwalkers that, and you never got to land. That must be so frustrating for you, Al, seems to be the question I always hear. No big deal. <laughs> um, the, 
way we perceive the guys who make lunar flights today is very different from the way they were perceived within the program. Uh, it was a whole different thing back then. Um, each flight had to have three people on the flight. And that was because you had to have two people in the, in, in, in the vehicle that was making dynamic maneuvers. You had to have somebody flying and somebody looking over your shoulder on every, you know, whenever there was a dynamic maneuver that had to be made, such as launch, docking, uh, undocking, uh, flying the lunar module down to the surface of the moon, coming back up. You've got to have two people in that dynamic, in the, in the vehicle that's making the, the, the maneuvers. Uh, which means you've got to have three guys on the flight. Now, the third guy is the guy who stays in orbit while the other two are down on the surface. And I don't think anybody fully appreciates the sacrifice that we made in waiting for those guys. Uh, and I'll tell you about, a little bit about that later on. I mean, I was the one who could come home, right? So I didn't take any crap off anybody. Uh, but uh, there, there, there's, within the program back in those days, there's, a, there's another aspect of that, and that is that generally the command module pilot became the commander on flight three flights down, not the lunar module pilot. Because the lunar module pilot never flew anything. Now, the media has kind of turned that around, and now it's important if you walked on the moon or not, uh, whether you flew anything or not. So it's, it's, it's kind of different today, and I don't mind that. It's fine with me. Uh, what I did mind, what I do mind about all that is that they cut the program short, and I never had a chance to get, you know, to, to, to advance any. Uh, but I was on the right path, and if you look back at the history of the program, you'll find that every command module, every commander on a flight was a command module pilot first, except for one guy, and that's Gene Sergeant on Apollo 17. And uh, that was the difference. I mean, he was the only difference in the program. Everybody else came up through the ranks like I was going, like I was part way there when this whole thing came down. So, I don't mind. Uh, it uh, turns out that uh, people focus more on those who walk. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, some years ago, Jim Irwin uh, tried to put together a, a group of moonwalkers. Uh, and, and the, you know, it was kind of interesting because he was kind of on a religious bent, and there were 12 moonwalkers. So you can imagine what the obvious comparison is. Uh, Twelve guys. Uh, that goes back in history and to the Bible pretty close, and that's the point that Jim Irwin was trying to make, and I always objected to that. Uh, and, I, and I had lots and lots of discussions with Jim about, you know, feeling the presence of God on the moon. I said, that's nonsense. If you could have feel it there, you could have feel it on Earth. But there was a big deal about the 12 moonwalkers uh, and they tried to make uh, you know something out of that, uh, kind of ignoring the CMPs. And uh, as a matter of fact, the CMP group only half the size of the Lunar Walker group, and we're even smaller than that now because we've lost two of them. Stu Rusa and, and Ron Evans are gone, uh, so there are only four of us left that uh, flew as a CMP. One thing that really I got working with Al appreciation of this was if you got to visit an alien planet and you had three days. Would you want to land in a very small place and grub around in a very small bit of dirt and maybe go just a couple of miles? Or would you like to travel in orbit around that planet, looking down at that planet? Which would you choose going to an alien planet? And I'm working with Alan. I know I, I made my decision. I want to be out. Well, let me tell you that the, the, the whole concept of going to the moon and putting a couple of guys on the surface of the moon was to collect rocks. That's all it was. Collect rocks in one space. Uh, further, the idea was you bring those rocks back to Houston, you analyze the rocks, then you compare them with, uh, with the data that you get from lunar orbit, such as I got with the Simbay. Now, we were the first flight that had the Simbay, uh, but that Simbay actually um, uh, was pointed at the lunar surface, and from the instruments that I had on board, uh, they, could, they could take that data, compare it with the rocks, and then they could start to build up a picture of what the chemical composition of the surface of the moon is. So, I guess the point is, I got probably a million times more data, as much data as they did on the surface, because they were stuck in one small place. And I didn't have to pick up any rocks, so they, you know, they, they went down there just to get rocks. That was it. <laughs> Big <deal. laughs> Another question.
question I know everybody asks you, because it is kind of amazing to think about, is a quarter of a million miles away, there's everybody alive apart from three people. And then there's two of them a couple of hundred miles away on the other side of this enormous ball of rock is the moon. And then there's you, on your own, literally, technically, however you want to describe it, the most isolated human being in existence. And one of the questions I always hear people ask you is that that must have been so lonely. And I, I'm always, I always love your answer to that one too. Well, that was the best part of flight. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, it's a, it's a little like this. The, the, the big thing about going into space, the, the very first thing you have to confront is how do you get along with two other people in space in a vehicle that's no bigger than a Volkswagen Beetle? And you got to be there for two weeks, you've got no facilities, you get, you know, when you have to go to the bathroom, you got to, I mean, you got, you got two other people watching you doing it. That's not much fun, but you get used to it. You decide uh, before you go that we're going to be explorers and we're going to put up with anything. And, you know, it's all part of the game. Um, when I got into orbit, well, after, after four and a half days in that cramped spacecraft with Dave and Jim, uh, when, I relieved, when I let them go and they went down to the moon's surface and I went into orbit by myself, I thought that was the best part of flight because I was so glad to get rid of them <laughs> um, from that tiny space that we had. Now I got this whole thing all to myself for three days, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but um, you know, you talk about being isolated uh, the backside of the moon, I couldn't even talk to Houston. That was absolutely the primo part of the flight. I had nobody from Houston telling me what to do. I didn't have Dave Scott looking over my shoulder telling me what to do. I didn't have anybody telling me what to do. I could do whatever I wanted. But I had a flight plan that I had to follow. And that flight plan was complicated enough and, and busy enough that uh, I probably put in, I put in, I think, 20 hours a day doing stuff for that three days. And, you know, and the idea is you're only going that way once. So you do everything you can. You, you don't want to let anything undone. You don't want to make anything undone uh, because you're not going back. That was a great time for me by myself. I was a fighter pilot. I flew single seat, single engine airplanes for the Air Force. And that was always the best thing for me. I didn't want to be responsible for anybody else. One of my favorite stories of yours and a lot of people's favorite in the book is when you were around the moon on your own, as you mentioned, you're a single-seated jet pilot. You're not. You're trained to not be aware of anything apart from what you are supposed to be concentrating on, because otherwise you crash and die. A lot of times in your career, you're, you're trained to tune that out. And yet here, I crash and die a lot. <laughs> <laughs> here on, on the far side of the moon, you're out of the Earth shine. You're out of the sunshine. You're in the shadow of both, mm -hmm. and all you've got is the darkness of the moon and the entire universe out there. And all of a sudden, you, you have an experience which is not a jet pilot experience in any way. No, no. That was the most amazing part of the flight for me. Uh, there is a, there is a, uh, a pie-shaped wedge of the orbit around the moon where I was shattered from the sun and shattered from the earth. Well, no, no light from the solar system was shining on me at all. Um, and I... Spent that time looking the other way, looking out, and it was just absolutely blowing my mind every time I looked out there. Um, we can see so many stars through the sky here. If you're if you're on the surface of the Earth and you're looking up through the atmosphere, there's so many stars you can see, uh, and it's about a million. Okay, ten to the sixth, let's say, somewhere in there. Uh, Thirty-seven. I think is the number of the brightest stars were the ones that we used for navigation on the way out, on the way back. And those were stars that we could pick out very easily because of, because of the brightness. And we also learned all the little guide stars that would take you to one of those stars. When I got to that part of the orbit behind the moon, I couldn't find the guide stars because there were so many other stars shining. As a matter of fact, it was hard to pick out individual stars because it was just a blanket of light out there. We don't have any concept what kind of universe we're working in, folks, that we're living in. We just don't have a good concept of what the universe is all about. We live in the Milky Way. We're about two-thirds of the way out on the arms of the Milky Way galaxy, which is our home galaxy. The solar system is part of that Milky Way galaxy. 
Uh, we count the planets in the solar system. We count one star as our sun. Uh, but when you understand that the total number of stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is somewhere between 200 and 400 billion stars. Billion, with a B, in our own galaxy. And then, when you hear from the astronomers that there are probably another 200 billion galaxies out there, you say, all of a sudden you say, I don't think we understand the universe very well. Because we're very, very self-centered about what we think. Um, and, and if you go back to uh, even the early days of the space program, we were talking about all this. Um, the conclusion was that there's so many stars out there that there had to be a certain finite number of them that were the same size as our sun, solar, and, and with, with a planetary system around them. And there are going to be a finite number of those planetary systems that have an atmosphere like the Earth has. There's going to be a finite number of those that are going to have some intelligent beings on them. And that number turns out to be millions. Huge number. So this is one of the things that you think about in that, in that part of the orbit around behind the moon. You say, wow, you know, there's, there, I know there's intelligent life out there. Do we ever see it? No. Have I ever seen it? No. I have a friend in, I, I, I live in Grand Rapids right now. I have a friend there who is absolutely convinced that he can bring in a, 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 a UFO. He can bring in a flying saucer. So I actually went out with him one night when he was looking for a flag. A friend and I went out with this guy one night. And he was going to call in this flag saucer. He said he could do it all the time. Well, we sat there for two hours, got eaten up by mosquitoes. But you know, and we were just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, he said, well, I don't think you're going to come tonight. And I said, well, why do you think that is? I thought you could call him in. He said, well, I think it's because you two guys are with me. <laughs> and so my next question was, was there anybody with you when you saw these things before? He said, no, I was by myself. So this is my problem with the UFO business, is that it's always something that somebody says they saw and you can't prove it in one way or another. But I tell you, when you get in that part of the orbit around the moon and you look out at the universe and you begin to realize how infinite that thing is out there, you begin to realize that, yeah, there are going to be intelligent species out there. We're not, we're not unique. They might not look like us, but I think they would. In fact, as a matter of fact, when you really complete the circle, where the heck do you think we came from? And I absolutely believe we came from somewhere else. It's called survival of the species, and every single living thing on Earth has a mechanism to, to, to ensure the survival of its species. And I don't care if it's a blade of grass, it's a tree, it's a cow, it's a dog, or it's a human. That is our genetic code, is to survive. Everything here on Earth, except humans, has to figure out a way to survive on Earth. But we have the ability to go somewhere else. Now, just turn it around. Turn that idea around. Somebody else, somewhere, long, long ways away, had the same problem. And they got out. Maybe we're their descendants. I don't know. I, I can't prove any of that. That's just a gut feeling I have. But that's what you start to think about when you look at the universe in that part of the orbit back there. And maybe it's a lot of other factors in it too. I don't know, but 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 I do believe that. And I think that. And and there and there is a certain amount of knowledge out there that supports that conclusion. I can give you the author of all the books and all of the translations of the ancient Sumerian text as proof that that's the case. But there you go. I find this interesting stuff. You came from somewhere else, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sitting in my wallet saying I'm a resident alien, so I don't have any other idea. Yeah. I think there's a planet out there called Manchester. <laughs> the <best planet laughs> in the yeah, you can tell by his answer. <laughs> I, I do find this fascinating that, you know, not to get too philosophical, but we experience things and we know them ourselves. You know, we can look at somebody else's holiday pictures and go, that looks nice, and then we go there ourselves. We go that that experience and go, it's different. I don't, you know, we may, three or four hundred years from now, when people really have a, everybody maybe have a, has a gut sense of the universe, people may go back, well, who was the first guy who really had that sense? Who was the, the person who was the equivalent of a, re a renaissance medieval person or something who went, hey, hang on a second, this is not quite what we're all thinking, this is different. Who's the first person to experience that? And Al may be that guy, you know, it's, it's this, what I find interesting about Al is, He's asking questions. He doesn't know the answers. He just was out there looking, going, I know enough to know that we don't know. 
what a, what a profound experience just to look out at the universe and go, all I know is that everything we think we know is not quite enough, there's something else, and, and what an experience to have. So, yeah, who needs to walk on the moon when you get something like that, that's for sure. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you go back in history, you say, there was a time when we didn't know anything about gravity. Then we got a bright guy who dropped an apple, and he said, oh my gosh, you know, it fell down. Why did it fall down? Well, there's gravity that pulled it down. So we developed the concept of gravity, right? There used to be a time when we didn't know how to handle negative numbers. There was no such thing as a minus number. Well, we finally figured out how to handle negative numbers. Now we're getting into more and more complex things, and we don't understand them, so we say, well, they're unsolvable. Well, that's wrong. You know what? There was a time when we didn't think it was faster than the speed of sound. Now it's just, it's, it's too bad <coughs> that we thought that. I think that a thousand years from now, we're going to look back on our time today, and we're going to say, well, it's really stupid that we didn't think we'd go faster than the speed of light. Because we can't. There's nothing that we can't do. And if we go faster than the speed of light someday, we're going to find all kinds, of, we're going to be Star Trek people. And we're going to be out there, and, you know, all kinds of uh, multiples of the speed of light going places. I do, I firmly believe that because, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not that I don't see these things as, as solvable. I, you know, I don't even begin to think about it. You just look at the things that we've solved in the past and how we have developed and how we have found solutions to things that we didn't think were solvable. And now here we are. So I, you know, I think, I think the day will come when we're going to develop the capability to go other places. And I think that capability was already developed somewhere else long before we got here. Something else you probably did expect, because a lot of guys who've gone to the moon before you had remarks on it, is the Earth rise and how profound and beautiful that was going to be. But you did something different on your flight. Rather than just look at the Earth rise yourself, you actually chose to have a special message you sent back to Earth every okay. time we saw the Earth rise. Oh, that's, that's another story. I had a geology instructor, and if you've read the book, you'll, the name will be familiar. Uh, Farouk El Baz. Wonderful guy, Egyptian petroleum geologist, uh, who um, went to Heidelberg University, then he went to MIT and got his PhD in petroleum geology. While he was at MIT, he met and married a redheaded, blue-eyed Irish girl named Pat, who was an absolutely wonderful person. Uh, when he got his PhD, he went back to Egypt, and he took Pat with him to Cairo and they would not recognize her or, her or their marriage. And because the government got a little upset with him, they conscripted him into the army and they sent him out to the, uh, out to the desert to, to, to train the troops. And they had left Pat in Cairo by herself and she stayed in line all day long in some government office trying to get all the paperwork squared away for her marriage. And they never would do anything. So she ended up getting out of airplane going back to Boston. Well, by and by, Farouk got a, a call from Heidelberg that said, would you come up and present the paper that he had written uh, on petroleum geology or some kind of geology. And surprise, surprise, the government let him go. Uh, he didn't think they'd let him go. Anyway, they let him go. Uh, he went to Heidelberg, gave his paper, and then kept on going and ended up in Boston. And he became part of the Bell Labs team that worked with NASA to help resolve and investigate all these various phenomena that we're going to be looking at on all these flights. And they were probably the best equipped people in the world to do that. And he became the orbital geology instructor for all of us CMPs. Wonderful guy. He'd come down to the Cape, and we'd talk about this and that and the other thing. And one day, uh, well, I can talk about Mr. Rogers too, but, but Farouk was all kind of part of that. And we got to talking one day about we need to do something a little different on our flight that had never been done before. Uh, something to make the flight a little more human, something to, you know, kind of bring it home to everybody, not just not just English speaking people, but to everybody. So we came up with this idea of, uh, of, of putting Hello Earth Readings from Endeavor in every language we can think of. And Farouk went and translated them all and he I'm kind of dumb, so he did it all phonetically for me, so that I, you know I just I just followed the phonetics. Every time I came around the moon and 
first made contact with Houston, then I would quote one of those in whatever language, and I'd just go through the list. And first it was, you know, we go, we go English, and then French, German, right on down the line till we get to uh, Arabic and, 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 and Chinese and all that. Um, and that was kind of, kind of fruit, felt me with that. Uh, he also helped us name the, uh, the our spacecraft. Uh, it was a big problem to name it spacecraft back in those days. And you, you, you understand that the crew, uh, they, 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 had, they were given a couple of very, very important things that they, that they could do on their own. One of them is they could design their own crew patch, and the other is they could name their own spacecraft. But everything had to be approved by Washington, so it really was kind of a scam. I mean, you know, you come up with something, you send it to Washington, no, 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 we've already used that name. So anyway, Fruit was coming through uh, Washington National one day, and he picked up a, a book on old explorers, and in that book was Captain Cook. And he sailed three ships down to the South Pacific. And the one that he sailed down there that was considered the first uh, scientific voyage to the South Pacific was in a sail was in a was in a ship called Endeavour, and so we picked that as our Endeavour. But that he was he was he was a great guy. One thing I found out after we wrote the book was that you took a piece of wood with you that was believed to be from the wreck of Cook's Endeavour. In the decades since, they believe they've misidentified it. You probably took a bit of a different ship altogether. We may have, but we didn't know it at the time, so it didn't make any difference. Sure. <laughs> but it's in, but, but whatever ship it came from, it's in the Marine Museum up in Rhode Island, I think. Yeah. We also carried a uh, hat and a ring insignia from Eddie Rickenbacker's World War I airplane. It was on canvas. You know, it's, it was cut out of his airplane, cut off the side of his airplane, we carried that. And we actually gave it back to him in person. So I was fortunate enough to meet Eddie Rickenbacker. That was kind of a neat thing. And none of the things that people, they imagine you're flying to the moon, they imagine you, there's three guys sitting there looking out the window, the moon growing bigger in your windows, kind of like a science fiction movie. And what surprised me and a bunch of other people, you know, researching this is you don't really see the moon as you're approaching it until you're actually already in orbit. And one of the things I really liked, the way you described it, is the first time you looked down the moon, you saw these kind of ghostly glowing waves coming towards you. That was really what you saw. And it was hard to kind of work out what it was you were seeing at that moment. Well, the first, the first part of that, um, getting to the moon, we never saw it. The reason we never saw it is because we're going backwards. See, that, that nice thing about flying into space, you can fly in any attitude you want to fly in. You can go backwards, sideways, forward, however you want. There's no air that's gonna that's gonna affect your flight. So you can you're gonna go in that direction no matter what attitude you're in. Well we went into the moon backwards because when we got behind the moon we had to slow down and the engine is behind us. So we had to fire that engine behind us to slow us down to go into the lunar orbit. So we never really saw the moon until we got into until we made that maneuver, we got into the lunar orbit, we could turn around put the windows down and, and look at the moon. And it was, it was kind of strange. It was kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, uh, if, you ever, if you ever look at, the, at, at an ocean where the, where the sun is real low and all you see are kind of waves in the ocean. Oh, that's what it looked like. But those were mountains and craters and things on the moon that gave you that same optical uh, impression uh, that you would see actually in the ocean where all you're seeing is the sun hitting the tops of the waves, and you don't see the trough, so all you're seeing is bands of light out there. Uh, kind of kind of interesting view from there. We saw, saw a lot of really interesting things on the surface of the moon. Uh, part of, part, I think the most important thing that, 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 we, just, that we saw, that I saw, uh, were some cinder cones. Uh, they were in the Taurus littoral area. We had been trained, I had been trained by Farouk to look for cinder cones because there was this big argument going on, what's, what made the features on the moon? How did they get to be? And there were, there, there, were, there were two theories, one was that there were meteor impact and the other was they were volcanic. Um, and, the, and the geologists would argue about these, and we'd have big arguments over a campfire when we were on doing geology field trips about what makes the features on the, on the moon. Well, we hadn't seen any volcanic activity, um, and so it was kind of important to, to, 
see if we can if we can find any evidence of volcanic activity. In tourist literary, I saw a whole field of these little cinnacles, and you can tell cinnacles. They're perfectly circular, and there's a dark spot in the, in the middle where the cone comes up. Um, I wasn't supposed to be able to see them because they weren't wide enough for my depth, for my height, to make it out right. Uh, but it turns out that there are some tricks you can use. Um, you know, they say, uh, I remember back in the day when, they, when Gordon Cooper, on his Mercury flight, said he could see the Great Wall of China. And everybody poo pooed that. They all said, oh, hey, there's no way. It's not wide enough for him to see. Turns out that the eye can see, if, you're, if you sweep past it, it's like night vision. You sweep past something, you get an image that's retained, and you see much finer detail. But you, but you don't focus on it. The minute you focus on it, it kind of goes away. Gordon Cooper could see the Great Wall of China because it was linear. And so his eye retained that. I could see those cinder cones, and they, nobody believed me. Uh, until we got the film back that I had taken, and sure enough, cinder cones were there. And sure enough, they changed the landing site for Apollo 17 to go there because of that. Uh, but that, but it's kind of interesting that the difference between the, 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 the impact craters and the, and the volcanics on, on the moon, and that's kind of what we were looking for from Logan. Uh, after your first night in lunar orbit, um, now we know that Air Force test pilots never get scared of anything. It's just impossible. It's not in your DNA. However, where'd you hear that? I, I think you told me repeatedly. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but I was trying to impress you. <laughs> you were, um, you got into a state of higher alertness when you woke up that morning and took the took the shades off the windows and looked out and saw lunar mountains not quite where oh, you expected them to be. Okay. Yeah, that was that was before Dave and Jim landed. That they were still with me. We went into an orbit, it was kind of interesting. We, we tried something, we tried several new things on our flight. One was, we had a landing site that was 28 degrees away from the lunar equator. First time that had ever been done. Uh, all the landings before ours were in a band of plus or minus 10 degrees. We knew the gravitational constants in that band pretty darn well. So the, 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 the controllers in Houston knew exactly what to do. We were in a, uh, our landing site was 28 degrees north in a mountainous area. We didn't know the mass concentrations. We didn't know the gravitational constants up there. So we were a little, you know, being pretty conservative with what we did. We did something else, though, that, that had never been done before. And that is we dropped our orbit over the landing site so that they would have extra fuel. It wouldn't have some particle. So we'd have extra fuel when we got down there. Uh, our orbit, and I, the, the numbers are kind of fuzzy to me now. I, I, I think the real numbers are maybe a little different than, than I remember them. But we went into an orbit that was uh, probably, what, uh, well, 50,000 50, feet over the landing site, something like that. Which meant that we were on about, you see the landing site was, uh, I don't know, 5,000 feet, something like that. So we were up maybe 60,000 feet. Well, over the, over the night, the gravitational attraction of the moon started changing our orbit. We got lower and lower and lower and lower. And the next morning when I got up, um, I pulled the shade off the window and I was looking out ahead and, I, and the mountains above us. And of course, that was an attitude. If we had pointed out, it would have been different. But we were, we were kind of pointing horizontal and, and I'm looking up at the mountain and I'm thinking, oh boy, what is going on? So I called Houston and they said, oh boy, we're glad you called. Um, <laughs> we, we, got to, we got to do something here pretty quick. They said, well, what's the problem? Well, your orbit's been decaying all night long and you're now like 46,000 feet, uh, and, the, and that mountain was 15,000 feet, so we weren't too far above it, and we could see some awfully small rocks <laughs> with our big eyes looking at it. So anyway, we got, we got Dave and Jim in the lunar module, and after a little, we had a little, little fuss about that because we had a, we had a, there was a cable that, that uh, goes through the docking adapter, um, and for some reason there was some grit or dirt or something in the, um, so uh, I had to go. I had, I had to get back up in the pull the pressure hatch off and get back up in there, and, and I had to pull that cable out and stick it back in to make sure that we had a good connection. So that cost us one revolution more than we wanted. Uh, but then Dave and Jim uh, undocked and went down on the surface of the moon, and I very quickly uh, got myself back into a 60-mile orbit. Uh, that without being low like that. Uh, 
Um, what was interesting about that uh, was that I'm flying in the left couch. I don't know how many of you have actually seen an Apollo spacecraft, but there are three couches laid out side by side. There are shock struts between the inner couch and the outer couch on both sides. So there are two shock struts that hold up three couches, and there are pressure plates on the outside end of the uh, couches that, you know, you could just, they, they were on a screw, and you could, you could move them out or move them in, and you'd move them out so that you've got, you know, you're firm in there, and all you got are these two shock struts. Well, we had taken the center couch out because it's much easier to move around than the spacecraft with the center couch out. And, I, and nobody had said anything about it, and I didn't think about it, and we just kind of kind of ignored the fact that that couch was sitting there by itself. Now that couch is sit, the strut is this way, and the couch comes out this way, and I'm sitting here in the couch, right? When I fired the engine to go back into a circular orbit, guess what happened? <laughs> the momentum of me, my mass, offset. I, I wasn't this way, I was offset swung me right up into the instrument panel on the right-hand side, and I couldn't reach any of the instruments. I couldn't reach any of the controls. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, I hope this thing does what it's supposed to do. I hope it shuts down that engine at the right time as well. <laughs> and it did, and everything was fine. But that was just something we kind of forgot. And I'll tell you what, that was probably the, uh, you know, you, you get your heart in your throat at times when you fly, and that was one of those times I thought, oh my God, what's going on? You know, but, and then I realized what we had done. And uh, nobody ever said anything. I didn't think about it. It was fun. <laughs> like, just as you told me you never get scared of anything, I, I remember also when you were trying to impress me, you told me you never made any mistakes on flight whatsoever. And um, I tell you that. You told me, that was the first time you made it. I did. Yeah. But uh, this being the first all Air Force group, um, you decided to try and do something special when uh, Dave and Jim were taken off from the lunar surface, which <laughs> somebody else just messed that up for you. Yeah, well, I don't know what happened there, but we were allowed, we, I took a, a, a cassette player with me, and I had lots and lots of little tapes that, I, that we could play during the flight, and uh, one of the tapes I got was the Air Force song. I thought when they were getting ready to take off, I would play the Air Force song for the troops back in Houston. So that they'd have this Air Force song in the background and David Jim would go through the checklist and all that. What I didn't know was that the guy in Houston had forgotten to turn the repeater off. So everything I said was hitting Houston and going right back into the lunar module. So they were getting the Air Force song blaring in their earphones while they're trying to do their checklist to get off the of the I didn't know that at the time, but I sure found out about it when they got into orbit. <laughs> uh, and, and in such a way that I will never forget that conversation. Uh, and he was not too happy with me, and I tried, I tried to explain it. I said, well, I played it for Houston, but, you know, I, I, you know, I just assumed that they would not send it back up to you because it was for them. But somebody forgot to turn that switch off, so he got it. Incidentally, about a month later, uh, we were at an Air Force Association in Washington receiving an award and uh, they thought that uh, playing at Air Force was pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> so you have survived the most critical dangerous parts of the mission, you got into lunar orbit, you picked these two guys up, you got out of lunar orbit, you got all the way back to Earth, you're in those last few moments before you're going to get to the ocean and right then the most critical part of that moment, the parachutes, something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we lost the parachute on the way down. We're the only flight that had that happen. We landed with two, on two parachutes instead of three. Didn't make a lot of difference. The system was designed for two. Third one was a safety factor, and it only made about uh, maybe a three foot per second difference in our velocity coming down, wasn't much. Uh, but the reason we lost that parachute was uh, coming down, uh, we had, in the command module, we had small rocket engines that we used to 
maintain attitude or to maneuver. And those little rocket engines, they're very, they're tiny little engines. They use what they call hypergallic fuel. Hypergallic fuel is highly corrosive, highly toxic. It's the kind of fuel, is, there's, a, there's a kind of like uh, a basin in a, and in a second, you know, a second uh, fuel. When they touch each other, they explode and they burn. And that's where you get your, you, you get your thrust from. Well, it's, it's um, nitrogen tetroxide, and I forget what it is. Fueling nitric gas, I don't know, frankly, but they're, they're really bad things. So the idea was when we get all the parachutes out and we're coming down kind of slow, uh, we would purge all the fuel lines from this highly toxic stuff because you don't want to hit something in the water and have all those fuel lines break. And all of a sudden you got all this highly toxic, deadly stuff floating around. So the idea was to purge all the fuel lines. Well, we did that, but it turned out the, earth, the weather conditions were exactly right that day, that when we purged the fuel out, it went straight up in the shroud lines and hit one parachute. And that highly toxic stuff just loved nylon. Man, it ate up that nylon like you wouldn't believe. I could see little holes in like this. And it didn't take long for that chute to just collapse, so we came down. What we never really talked about it very much is that the second shoot was going as we hit. So it's a good thing we got in the water when we hit. That was, that, that was kind of an interesting moment. And our big problem, you gotta understand, we're all Air Force guys. Our big problem were all those Navy guys flying their helicopters around <laughs> on the emergency channel yelling at each other, trying to get everybody's attention the fact that we lost a parachute. And I, it's all coming to me through the emergency channel. And I'm sitting there watching this whole thing unfold, and I got this just absolute hysterical conversation going on there. I finally broke in, and I said, everybody, please, just shut up. We know what's going on. So that's the Navy for you. They get very excited. So the, the Apollo 15 mission is over, but the, the work for the scientists and engineers is only just beginning. They're beginning to analyze the rocks, they're beginning to debrief you extensively day after day, going through the data. It's considered still today probably the greatest engineering achievement ever, this particular mission as part of Apollo. And yet, what you did next surprised a lot of people, which is you had your own more personal debriefing. You wrote a book of poetry mm -hmm. about the mission, and I, I found that very interesting how that came about. That's kind of, kind of, kind of fun. I don't know. Um, I have to say that, that uh, as I was growing up, my goal in life was to be a concert pianist. And I took uh, music lessons for 12 years and uh, actually was going to be in uh, music school when I went to college. Uh, when I got an appointment with West Point, I went there and that killed my music career. But, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're into music at all, it stays with you forever. And um, so, I, you know, I kind of, after the flight, I'm kind of thinking this and that and the other thing, and I'm, and, and I'm organizing this stuff as I would a song, like I'm writing a song. And it came out as poetry. And, um, and what, what was weird about it was that when we got back from the flight, the thing that helped me do that was that we would go over to the center and debrief all day long. I get back to my apartment and I say, we didn't have to go to quarantine after the flight. For us, anyway. Uh, so I get back to my apartment, there'll be a party going on. Uh, for two weeks that went on. And the party, I finally kick everybody out about 10 or 11 o'clock. And I'd be so wound up after debriefing all day and not getting any sleep, I could I couldn't sleep. And I'd sit there in my living room with all the lights turned out. And I'd start having all these thoughts, and I thought one day, well, I think I'll just get a paper and pencil and I'll just write down my thoughts, and I go, and it turned out to be poetry. I, I, and I never forced it, I never tried it, I never. Never, never worked it, but when I looked at it the next day, I thought, hmm, oh my gosh, that's, and I started, I, I, I had some friends who asked me to do a poetry meeting for the Houston Poetry Society, I did, and the next thing I knew, a company wanted to publish it, so that's what he got. That was kind of fun. You have some of those books? I did that because of my musical background, a lot of it. Um, and you know, everybody talks about, uh, you know, we need to send a poet into space, and, and, and you know, People overlook the fact that I wrote a book of poetry. I got some here. Yeah, brought some. There aren't any. There aren't any available anymore. I've got them all because 
the, the company that published the book after a while, we finally decided that they, we didn't sell any more, so they called me one day and said, we got, we got a few remainders to go on this before we send them to a book remainder company. I said, yeah, sure. So I, I bought all the books that are left. So, and I gouge, I gouge with them. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't cost me very much, but I, but, but, but I ask a lot of money for them now. Well, of course, I've, I've maintained them now for the last 40 years, too. <laughs> So, Jay, we've probably got about 10 minutes left until the end, and I was thinking we want to do some Q&A up at the microphone. However, before we, we do that, one last story I thought would be fun for you to tell in person, which is, it wouldn't be Space Fest if you didn't rank Dick Gordon a little bit. <laughs> and um, this story I'll just introduce is, Dick Gordon and a loose cockpit can be. Dick Gordon is my buddy. <laughs> Dick Gordon is my mentor, uh, I was his backup on Apollo 12. Uh, we spent a year and a half training together, and he was he was uh, a commander. Uh, he was a backup commander on Apollo 15, and we still got to train together. So we're flying all over the country every week together. Um, and Dick's my favorite guy in the world. Okay, in fact, I introduced Dick and his wife many, many years ago. So I feel a little responsible for what I did to her, but you know, <laughs> so they, 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 they've been fine. Uh, but Dick and I were flying a T-38 out to L.A. one time, and we got to El Paso, and our, 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 the way we did things back then was, we were pretty cool because we are a civilian agency. We didn't, have to, we didn't have to comply with all the military rules, right? So we would wheel into El Paso, and you couldn't get all the way to L.A. in one leg, so you had to stop it. Paso to refuel. So we pull up to, in front of El Paso, the, the, the terminal, the right? uh, yeah, little fixed piece operator, and, 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 and the little guy would come out with a fuel line, and then he'd come on out a couple of minutes later. Well, it's really being refueled. He'd come out and he'd have a couple of tacos for us to eat while we're refueling. It was kind of neat. Um, this one night, uh, it was night, uh, we got our tacos, we got our fuel, and started taxiing out and and while we've been sitting there and during the course of the flight before some of our baggage had gotten up into the canopy well the canopy on a t-38 is it's just in the rear of the canopy just simple two hooks and they and they come off if you were to raise the back of the canopy by itself it would just come off but those hooks when you when you when you lower the canopy then those hooks sealed it well we had something underneath the canopy that made the back of it come up and the whole canopy came off on our taxi on the way out. And it happened before um, uh, to other guys. I don't know what happened to Lowell. Anyway, uh, we took the airplane back into the fixed base operation and we called Houston and said, you know, we gotta, we, we gotta send somebody out, we gotta reset the canopy. Uh, in the meantime, we had to get out to LA, so we got a ride over to the terminal and we were gonna go out to LA on Southwest Airlines, if anybody remembers Good old Southwest, it was a great airline. Uh, pretty girls. Um, we had on our flight suits, and we were carrying our helmets in a bag, and we had our overnight bag, and we had our parachutes. <laughs> so we got, we got in this Southwest airplane, and they were kind of, they were nice enough to put us in the front row, right? Right up front. So we sat down in the seats, we strapped our parachutes on, uh, we got our helmets out with our oxygen masks, and the two of us were sitting up in front of the airplane, all dressed, ready to go. And somebody in the back of the airplane panicked. <laughs> what are those, what's going to happen? Those guys got their versions on. So we had to take our helmets off. But, uh, that's how we got out to LA that night. That was a great fun. We, and that's, that's what our relationship was. We, we, a lot of fun working 10, 12 hour days, but having a lot of fun at the same time. And that's what you got to do. That program is so intense and so hard. You got to have a sense of humor. You got to have some levity that you can spread around. Otherwise, you can go crazy. Yeah. So you get an idea of just how much fun it was working with Alan on this book. And uh, right after this, we're going to be out at the book signing table signing books for about half an hour uh, together. And I've memorized every face in here, too. <laughs> Uh, Al's also obviously around for the rest of the show too, and uh, we definitely encourage you to at least come and have a look at a copy. I think Jay wants to do it so everybody can hear the question. If you could go to the mic in the middle.